then then Val gets to yeah. play around in the caldera <laughs> over her watch. Um, yeah, so this is awesome. We've got some big sponges and stuff up here. Th this ridge is just crazy. Um, oh. And we're now at the depth where we might be able to see these little sharks that I've been looking for, so we'll keep an eye out for that. And uh, yeah. Nice. The, they're, um, like, they're called lantern sharks. There's a couple different species that are in these waters, and we saw them on the first couple of dives, mm -hmm. and they've been only seen in, in a handful of, uh, of these seamounts, so it'll be, it's good to get additional documentation of their depth and range. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to get like a record of what depths we see them at and when, and, and then some screen captures, and then we'll have a, a colleague uh, that Daniel, Daniel Wagner knows um, maybe help us ID some of them. And, uh, yeah, just see, we, we haven't really seen them on a lot of dives because it's been a little too deep, um, but hoping that we'll get to see some of them here. Just a, you know, casual personal interest. You know, because sharks. Yeah. <laughs> were the ones that we saw before on our watch, were those dwarf lantern sharks? Please do a ship move. I'm not sure. Two zero meters at bearing zero seven five. There was one on our first or second dive that Thank you. had different coloration that I think was uh, actually a Hawaiian uh, lantern shark, which has only been described on two different seamounts. So that would be really cool if we saw it somewhere else. The other ones, I think, yeah, maybe dwarf or just regular lantern sharks, but I'm not sure. We need it. We need a better expert than too me much. on that. That's fine. In other we can slow down if it's news, too much. apparently there's some kind of smudge on the still camera, so that oh. may not be as useful as it has been. I can see it kind of here, so uh, not sure how that happened, but we'll get that cleaned off uh, before the next dive. Did you copy that, Jake? What was that smudge? There's I'm a smudge on the still camera. Just an FYI. <laughs> you swim, swim down there and clean it off. Mm -hmm. Roger that. <laughs> Roger yeah. that. Did we bring a microfiber cloth with us? No, so no, we could, we other, could, uh, other Jake. Yeah. With the uh, with the arm, we can just you yeah know, polish yeah. it gently yeah. polish it. Yeah, it's not sharp or anything. What's the worst that could happen? Huh. Oh, be the worst yeah. thing. Isn't it just gouge the other camera? Uh, before we start any introductions, I do see some questions in here about rock sampling, and I know that a rock sample was just taken. Um, Hannah, could you share with some viewers about like what makes for a good rock sample? Why do we want those angular ones, and we try not to find like really flat ones? Can you give an explanation yes, for why? Yes, I can give an explanation. So a lot of the flat ones that we've pulled up have mostly been the manganese crust instead of the rock itself. And with these angular rocks, there's a higher chance of the whole rock, or at least majority of it, compared to a flat rock. So also, if you notice, I'll try to point it out too, if we pick a rock sample, that some of these rock samples have, these basalts have a like almost like a flow line to it that mm -hmm. kind of looks slant, not slanted, but like curved. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it was once a part of the flow. So that would indicate that hopefully there would be nice minerals there to look at yeah. and analyze for determining our age, the ages of these rocks. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And then can you describe, like, right now, what kind of flow are we looking at? Yeah, Is so... Is low bay? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. So there are three different types of flows for seamounts. And one is, well, they depend, they're categorized by velocity. So the fastest is the sheet flow. The second fastest medium velocity is low bait flow, which is what we're looking at right now. And the slowest flow is the pillow lavas, which we will most likely see because I saw some this morning. And then even when I was observing the other watches, I saw some pillow lavas. Mm -hmm. So I think I even saw a few sheep, but I'm not sure because I only looked up at the screen for like a few seconds. <laughs> and then I was like, huh, that's different. And then I just went back to, I was the reading. Puzzle. The puzzle. Oh. Yeah, no, no, I was, I was <laughs> reading that time. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to see if what type of flow we're going to see when we get closer to the caldera, or if it's just all going to be fractured and destroyed. I'm just, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Because this is, I think, 
everybody is saying that this is the first, I'm pretty sure this is the first caldera we're, we're looking at. Yeah, I mean, for this, um, for this expedition, for sure. It's, I mean, I don't think, in looking at some of the uh, the seamounts we've mapped, they're just, they're ha you know, they're not a lot that, if there were calderas that are still present, you know, to take a look at. So this is pretty exciting. Yeah, I've, I've been really happy with the geology that we have seen, though, because yeah. they had some real, at least in the morning when we first landed, there were some really nice pillow lavas. It didn't look like debris flow or fragmented rock. It was, it was so satisfying to see. Sebastian, could you share a little bit about some of the biology and some of the life that we're seeing down here? Um, a viewer is wondering if maybe there's a resource with a lot of the commonly encountered species that they could look at and reference while we're watching. Um, yeah, of course. So a good re resource for learning about the animals that we're looking at and kind of taking a look along with us is the um, NOAA Benthic Underwater Animal Guide which has a little drop-down menu by um, phylum, and it goes further down depending on the species, and that has a bunch of different pictures of animals as we go. Um, it doesn't have super detailed descriptions of them, so you only have the photo to go off of. So that's why we have our lovely scientists ashore in the, ch in the chat who help us with the IDing of the more particular areas and the more particular um, details of identifying very similar species. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. OK, we're a little bit settled in now. And for this was not the question that I was going to ask earlier today. Okay. I'm going to save that for one, our last dive together. Okay. Um, to, for this watch, for our introductions, um, you know, our usual name, Roll where you're from, and then we've touched on this in a previous dive, um, and it was actually a question from a viewer who was wondering if um, we were doing what we thought would we would be doing, like when we were younger, kind of how we envisioned our futures, and like if this is where you saw yourself in your career at this point in your life, and um, I think that's really important for not just our youth to hear that may be watching, but like folks of all ages to just kind of hear how. Um, each of us have a very different path to getting to this point, and I think that can be really exciting to hear. So I kind of wanted us to share a little bit about that. So I'll go first. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Tori Hunt. I am sailing as a science communicator for the 4 to 8 watch. And when I'm not sailing, I am a high school science teacher from, or teaching right now in North Carolina. Um, and I am originally from North Carolina. Uh, when I was younger, I, for a very, very long time, uh, really wanted to be a marine biologist because I loved all things ocean, all things sharks specifically, and you heard me when I came and be excited about the oceanic white tips we saw outside before we got in the control van. Um, but I'll be honest, I did not know how many different options there were in ocean exploration, really until I found Nautilus. And I'm really passionate about education, especially science education. and. This science communication role is kind of like the perfect combination of all the things that I'm really excited about right now. And it's completely opened up my eyes to just all the possibilities of how you can be part of exploring our ocean. So yeah, Malia, would you like to share a little bit? Sure, so aloha awina la kako, um, aloha to all of us. Um, yeah, so my name is Malia Evans. I, when I'm not on board the Nautilus, which is most of my life, I, um, <laughs> I work as the Oahu um, Outreach and Education Coordinator on Papahanao, for Papahanao Mokoakea Marine National Monument. Um, my role on board is as a uh, resource monitor and also an educator. And um, I actually, when I was a kid, I wanted to be three things. I wanted to be an author, mm. I wanted to be an artist, and I wanted to be an archaeologist. So those three things, when I think about it, I've um, fulfilled 
each of those yeah. in, in different ways. Um, and so I couldn't imagine myself being out here, literally, mm -hmm. when I was a, a child, like being able to participate in, in you know, deep sea exploration. But I've always left myself open to um, adventures. So I've, for me, I'm like, oh, okay, it's another adventure in life. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's so important that we just, life rarely comes out the way we plan it. Mm -hmm. And just being open and available to, you know, those those opportunities that come your way and just jumping on it coming off the grid, is, yeah. is pretty cool. Yeah, I love that, being open and available for any opportunity, any adventures that may come your way. Yeah. And I know that, you know, I work with high school students. A lot of them feel a lot of pressure to know exactly what they're going to do when they're done with high school. And, you know, for a lot of my students, I... Uh, try and encourage them to just kind of investigate what are your passions, what makes you excited, and follow those things, but also just keep your options open. You never know what you're going to find, yeah. and you may Say be yes. surprised. Yeah. Say yes to things you normally wouldn't that Absolutely. put you out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Like when you get out of your comfort zone, oh my God, the growth, yeah. the adventure. So say yes, even though you just don't feel like, you know, secure or successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great advice. I love that. Thank you, Malia. It's, it's, it's funny that you say the say yes thing, because that's actually, my mom had us all write letters to my sister when she graduated high school, and that was actually the subject of what I wrote to her was say yes, you know, to stuff that you're not sure you want to do, the stuff that scares you, just do it anyway. Yeah. Um, so it, it's so cool that you said that. Um, hi, everyone. Mike Brennan. I'm a maritime archaeologist with Search, Inc. I'm the co-lead scientist for this expedition and watch leader for 4 to 8. Um, yeah, I, you know, my path to where I am, it, it is kind of where I saw myself. I mean, when I was eight is when I discovered Dr. Ballard's uh, discovery of Titanic and Bismarck and kind of jumped head into, uh, or head first into shipwrecks, especially deep water shipwrecks, and wanted to do everything that Dr. Ballard was doing um, and, and ended up uh, being his graduate student and working for him for 13 years. And now I'm back on Nautilus. Um, however, that's not to say that it's not, it's been a straight road. I mean, it's, it's been a roller coaster with lots of um, things left and right. I mean, there's been huge up and downs. And, you know, I never thought that I would be leading dive, the deepest dives that Nautilus has ever done to three aircraft carrier shipwrecks from Midway. Um, that's, yeah, I mean, that's a dream expedition, which we just did, it, what, a week ago, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but there's been a lot of uh, downs as well. I mean, graduate school is, is certainly not the easiest thing for anyone. Um, I was also there. There were periods where I thought I was going to be a creative writer. I thought I was going to thought I was going to be a cop at one point. Um, you know, th there were certainly a, 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 like variations in the path. But I, like to answer your direct question, did I see myself here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's just, I mean, I'm so grateful and thankful to everyone who's helped me over the past decades to to get here. Um, and you know, a lot of it I attribute to. Um, my brothers and I were homeschooled uh, when mm -hmm. we were in, just through elementary school. My mom was a elementary school teacher, and she decided that she could do a better job than the school that she was teaching in, which is where we would have gone. So she did, and um, that's how we d we, t we were able to take little field trips to Woods Hole and discover mm -hmm. Dr. Ballard's work. Um, and then she taught the Jason Project in our middle school um, when we when we started going to grade school or public school. I mean, um, and and she's the one who saw my interest in that and kind of just like, you know, help me explore it. So, you know, there's, but there have been people along all along the way and that's, you know, you just have to find people who support you and, and, uh, stick with it even when, uh, curveballs are thrown at you. Mm. Amazing. And, uh, when you were sharing about your sister, was that a younger sister? Yeah. Yeah. Sister? So, that's, yeah. So my oh, sister's so 12 years younger than us. Um, or then my, I have a twin brother, so I say us. <laughs> um, uh, so we were, we were, you know, quite a bit older when she was growing up, mm -hmm. um, which is great for my mom because she had three babysitters because um, I, I have a younger brother as well. Uh, and, yeah, so when she graduated high school, we, we wrote her letters. And, and, yeah, saying yes to stuff that you're really afraid to do or you're mm -hmm. not sure you're good, you'd be good at or you're not sure you're good enough for. I mean, you guys have been saying, uh, you know, this entire expedition, like applying to the internships, you're – you're like, oh, they're not going to pick me. Yeah. Uh, you know, all of you guys are like, I'm so surprised that I'm here. And, you know, I was the same way. I was like, my senior year in college, I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. 
um, and I happened to write a letter to, to Dr. Ballard because he was giving a, a speech at my brother, my twin brother's college, and I had my mo I sent it to my mom, and my mom printed it out and brought it to him because she was going to see him uh, at the, uh, the, the talk, and she handed it to him, and he, I think he emailed me, and he's like, hey, by the way, I'm starting a graduate program in archaeological oceanography next year, and the year that I happen to graduate, you should apply. Wow. And I was, cool. you know, so it's like, mm -hmm. it's not like this was a direct path. It's like, yeah. it was a whole bunch of little opportunities that I happened to be, you know, I was in the right place for it and didn't say, oh, that scares me too much. I'm not going to do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Wow. I appreciate you sharing that story. Yeah. That's, that is so awesome. Yeah. And that initiative that you took too to like write that letter and kind of put yourself Yeah, well, mom was like, oh, you know, I've met him before. I'm, I'm you know, Matthew was in college there. I'm just, I'm going to go. I was like, I'm going to write him a letter. I'm going to tell him that I want to do it. You know, because yeah. I, I outlined, I was like, I've done what you told, because when I was an Ar uh, Jason Argonaut in high school with him, I, he told me, well, he says he did. I don't, neither of us really, I don't know. It was a long time ago. I'm pretty <laughs> sure he told me, you know, major in geology and archaeology because you, the, the hard sciences are as important as the, uh, as the archaeology. Mm -hmm. And I, and I did, and it wasn't that wasn't even planned either. I was going to go into geology, and then I actually dropped the geology major. Oh. I had, I, and then I, because I, I found classical archaeology, then I dropped that because I didn't want to take more Latin. Did anthropology and, and re-added geology later. But I wrote on this letter that was like, this is what I've done in college, et cetera, et cetera. I'd done a couple of archaeology field schools at that point, and taken some oceanography classes. So it was like, yeah, you just uh, and, and and emails and letters. You're, you're, I, I find I'm able to take more initiative than like talking to someone in person because I'm always mm -hmm. like afraid of saying something. So, mm -hmm. yeah, take the initiative. Ask uh, a professor if you can work with them because the worst thing they can say is no. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I know, Hannah, that's something that I had asked you to speak on a little bit. We even yeah. practiced drafting the email to send <laughs> yeah. to the professor to ask. But <laughs> thanks, Mike. That was awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, hi, I'm Hannah Parody. I work... Well, I am one, part of the science and data team as a geologist, and I am a, gra a grad student at California State University, Long Beach. And when I was little, I thought that I was going to be a vet because I loved animals. And also, my mom would always pick up animals. Oh, wait. Something You're wrong? good. Oh, okay. I thought something was wrong. Well, when I was little, we would always pick up like stray animals and just like, we never really went to like a rescue place to get our cats or anything. So it felt like we, like my mom has always been very gracious and helpful to animals. So I was like, mm -hmm. oh, like that's really awesome. Like maybe I can be a vet. And then I changed that idea because I watched a lot of movies when I was younger. Like, imagine like classic rom-coms and the woman is always like an editor in a magazine <laughs> or something. And she has like the best life ever. And I was like, wow, that's exactly what I could probably do. <laughs> that's funny. And then I was like, I was like, never mind. I hate English class. I can't do this. <laughs> and then, um, Go for Zoom. and then I switched. Hey, I had no idea what I wanted to be. Is this a crinoid? <laughs> Yeah, but it's in the water column. Everybody. Yes, it's the crinoid swimming, swimming in the water swimming column. Crinoid. That is so cool. Nice. You've been, in, you've been interrupted. Yeah, well, it looks like a little alien. It does. <laughs> awesome. Earlier we were talking about this color and how I felt like I hadn't yeah. seen that many. So, yeah, so when I was little, after me finding out that I didn't want to be an editor of a magazine. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, what can help people? That's what I really want to do. I was like, I just want a job that like helps people. Oh, okay. I love that. And so then I was like, well, the only thing that I could think of when I was younger was like, oh, a doctor. And then I was like, oh, I love like caring for babies. I think that'd be really cool to, I already talked about this, wanting to be a gynecologist. So then I thought I was going to be a gynecologist and then it actually changed in high school when I took my Bio 2 class with Ms. Koenig, who I did a ship to shore with. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. And I fell in love with biology. I was like, this is what I want to do. And my 
teach her, she was like, you know, you could become a vet. And I was like, wow, that, that'd be full circle moment for me because that's what I first wanted to be when I was little. And so I thought about being a vet, but I was like, no, like specifically, I really want to do marine biology because that's what I've really enjoyed the most. So I majored as a bio major. I went into college, LSU, as a bio major. And then after orientation, I was like, oh, I love geology. Well, after science orientation, I was like, the geology major sounds pretty cool. They get to go to a lot of places, and that's what I want to do. That so travel I, aspect, yeah? Yeah, the travel aspect is really what hooked me. So I switched it, and I was actually reflecting before coming out here. I was like, wow, how did I get so lucky to combine my love for marine ocean life with also ge geology. Like I didn't, like I didn't realize that until like coming here, I was like, wow, I'm doing what I wanted to do, didn't yeah. know existed. And yeah, so that was, that was awesome. And also my whole family, they're having a streaming party watching this right now. So I wanted to say hi and thanks for watching me at, at all the hours of the day that I tell you guys to. And I love y'all so much. And y'all have been some of my biggest supporters throughout, <laughs> throughout all, like everything that I've done. And I just, I can't thank you guys enough. But, that is yeah. so sweet. Yeah. It's my, they're, they're at my uh, sister's house and well, sister's apartment in Baton Rouge. Cause they're, they have an LSU game tomorrow. So. That's what they're going to be doing tomorrow. Oh, they, yeah, they won't be watching us. No, they won't be watching us. <laughs> <laughs> no. They'll be tailgating. I love that. I love that you said that this is, like, a perfect combination that you did not even know, like, was possible or, like, existed. Yeah. Uh, your interest, and I feel like I feel the same way. Like, yeah, I connected I don't, with you on that. I guess I kind of didn't finish answering that question. Like, I don't know if I actually saw myself being able to, like, come out here and be part of something like this. Mm -hmm. Um and I kind of got away from that dream for a long time. And right before I left, I showed, right before I left school to come on this expedition, I showed my students a presentation I made when I was their age in like ninth grade. And the whole thing was like marine science, marine science. And I think that was before I really kind of decided that I really wanted to teach. And this has just been an amazing opportunity that has really combined all the things that I love. So, so special yeah, and is. so grateful that it exists. And it's always good to have dreams. And yeah. like keeping, being aware of like your dreams. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> My mom said we can live stream at the tailgate. Yep. <laughs> no. There you go. Bring us to the game. <laughs> oh, they're actually going to the game. Yeah, oh, no, this? they're going to the oh, game. Oh, no, it's not a shark. Never mind. We have like a fish in the still cam to up to the left. But yeah. I keep thinking that smudge is something. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Thanks, Hannah. That was great. Thanks. Sebastian, what about you? Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sebastian Martinez. I am a dialoguer here aboard the Nautilus. Um, I'm also an undergraduate researcher at University of Hawaii at Manila. Um, it's kind of a coincidence that you bring up this question um, because I don't want to spoil too much, but if you keep an eye on the blog either tonight or early tomorrow morning, you may mm -hmm. learn more about my path. Okay. Um, oh, that's cool. But in general, um, I did not Dumb. see uh, myself being here initially. Um, I initially actually saw myself more of as a tropical um, reef ecologist. So I saw myself doing more scuba dive work, that type of work. Um, however, um, right after high school, I was fortunate enough to join um, the Nautilus out on my first expedition as right out of high school to the Mid Cayman Rise. And they kind of got me addicted to deep sea life ever since. I love that. And uh, while we're pausing there real quick uh, for the Parody family, if you uh, are on the website and jump over to the SAT3 feed, feed number three. Uh, let's see, where is that? There we go. There's a picture of... Uh, Oh, now you guys are going to look busy. Oh, uh, I'm looking to see Dr. what you're Brennan doing. Dr. Brennan and uh, Hannah there <laughs> doing uh, doing their thing. Oh, you, she's uh, put down her phone to stop texting you. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
You're also muted, but that's not new. <laughs> <laughs> We're just doing having all the wins here. Yeah. So I think they're watching it. They took a picture of it and they sent that they were looking at the quad view. Well, there so, you go. So they'll see you. So, yeah. All right, we'll go back to our Thanks. normal. Uh, yeah, you back to our regular programs. Yeah. Programming. Yeah, thank you. Regular programming. Can we get a zoom on that guy on the right right here? On the rocks? Is this a crime? Do you mean the sponge or the, the enemy looking anemone. object? Do we still the telestrator to the internet? Uh, yep. Cool. That one. I think it's fun. We can show people things. The texture of these rocks is, this manganese crust is really interesting. It looks kind of like it's over vesicular, more vesicular lava than smooth lava. Does it's, that make I mean, sense? I can't tell if it's vesicular right now. I mean, it like this zoom? sort of stuff. Go on in. Oh, I can't, I can't. Well, oh, that's cool looking. Okay. okay. Oh, 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 oh. Coming oh. out. <laughs> that's an anemone, yeah. Um, I'm actually thinking not. Really? Because of the white tips? Going it's in. the white tips. Usually for coralomorphs, <laughs> which is what I think this might be, the white tips are a lot smaller, which is what's confusing me. Um, what? What's the other thing you think it is? It's a coralomorph. Um, I'm going to put it down as a coralomorph. But I've never heard of that. Now you gotta here. look it up. We're trying to get a toehold here, so <laughs> thanks for your patience. No worries. What is a crown morph? Is that a coral? It or is coral-ish. It's it's hard to explain. <laughs> um, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, that didn't come up. Oh, it's I a see. it's kind of huh. a hexacoral, so it's kind of adjacently related to black corals. Huh. Assuming it is actually a coral morph, because looking at the photos, because Hannah, you can see them. Yes. The light whites yes. are usually dots opposed to white appendages, which is mm -hmm. what's confusing me. Asako is typing in the chat, so hopefully she will. Asako thinks it looks a little bit more like a normal anemone. Don't push. All right. Thank you, Asako. Brown, we're good. I think when I was looking, oh wow, that is so cool. This manganese cross has interesting texture. I think when I was looking, when you zoomed up on the... Oh, there's a sea star, star eating, for <laughs> dating. Ed, my dad said thank you for doing that. Yeah, you bet. I'm a dad too, so always <laughs> nice to see your kiddo. Although I think, I was just talking to Dr. Val about this. I want to see if I have my math right. I think our daughter is 421 months old, but I got to check. <laughs> I think this, um, some of the rock texture is botryoidal, but... I think it's like just yep. really, really tiny. 421. So to give a description to what botryoidal looks like, if you type it in, it's a really complicated spelling, but if you type it in, how it sounds, then you'll look up, it literally says grape-like, grape-like. So think about it as like little grapes cemented together, but in manganese crust. And, then and we're not sure why it does that. We don't know a lot about manganese crust. I figured that this introduction would take us a little bit to get through the entire van, so no worries if we like pause. But uh, Derek, what about you? 
Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Derek Sowers. I work for the Ocean Exploration Trust as a mapping operations manager, and uh, I'm the navigator for this watch. Um, I live in Durham, New Hampshire, and I always I've known for quite a long time that I wanted to work on marine work, primarily conservation. Um, I didn't really know that ocean exploration was even a field when I went to like grad school originally. Um, so I worked a lot in estuaries um, out in Oregon and New Hampshire. And then I learned about ocean mapping because it was a big program at University of New Hampshire where I was working. So I started getting really interested in that. Always enjoyed maps and um, backpacking and hiking, so <laughs> navigating by map. Um, and yeah, I got really fascinated by the technology of how to map the seafloor mm -hmm. and water column um, and decided I want to just kind of refocus my career on ha just becoming like a technical person on habitat mapping, like marine habitat mapping. Um, so I've always seen ocean mapping as kind of a tool to help do that and inform like good conservation and stewardship of the ocean. Um, and yeah, so I could have never really pictured myself out on a ship like this doing this kind of work. Uh, just an amazing opportunity. But I feel like, you know, um, just being at the right place at the right time and trying to position yourself with the right um, sort of skill set to adapt to opportunities okay. as they come. Um, yeah, and just kind of see where things take you and, and seize opportunities as they come, uh, like a lot of other people have said. Yeah, definitely. That's really good advice. And um, what was your master's degree in? It was in marine resource management. So that's um, it's basically like oceanography, like physical, chemical, mm -hmm. biological, geological oceanography. And then you could take classes that were sort of tailored to other interests. Like I took some marine policy, like environmental law type stuff. And I was really interested in like the ocean land interface. So I did like watershed processes, fisheries, ecology, um, watershed management, um, like river, uh, river biology, mm -hmm. hydrology, things like that. Um, so just really interested in the whole like sort of earth sciences around the coastal zone and then how to like combine that with management. So I did a restoration work for many years, like trying to restore marshes and fish passage so they could get back to their rivers for an That's really cool. Fish. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, and, that, and that was a lot of fun too, but uh, eventually I, I kind of got away from the marine side a little too much, so I wanted to get yeah. back into like marine protected areas and studying the ocean. So that's kind of why I went back and worked on a, a second degree in oceanography. Nice. Thank you for sharing all that. Sure. It's really awesome. And you're going to be sailing on more legs on this expe expedition season, is that right? Yeah, I'll be back out here in November for a couple weeks. Cool. Um, Aren't you our expedition lead for that one? Yep. Yeah, yep. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it should be fun. Um, so that'll be uh, a joint cruise with some partners from uh, U.S. Geological Survey and Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and NOAA Ocean Exploration, and we'll be mapping uh, a part of the ocean within the U.S. exclusive economic zone, so that's within sort of like U.S. controlled waters south of Hawaii that's never been uh, fully mapped, so that should be interesting. Awesome. Thanks, Derek. Yeah. Great. And if we have viewers that are interested in looking at, um, like, upcoming expeditions on the NautilusLive.org site, uh, there is an expedition page that you can click on and you can click and read about each of the separate expeditions, who's on them, what the goals are. Um, there's a lot of great information there. Nice. Jake, what about you? Um, I never really knew what I wanted to do, but I knew I always liked boats and ships. And part of that's due to my what my dad did for work. He was a naval architect, or still is a naval architect. And so he got me into that, and I'd, I'd go to his office after school and color in his drawings, his boats, mm -hmm. boat drawings, and, and then I'd, I'd build like model boats and Lego boats and all sorts of stuff. And I'd, in high school, I would join him on some some work and uh, 
do like stability tests of tall ships and that I got really interested in like just um, ocean engineering and stuff and originally I think I wanted to be a naval architect like him but then he showed me ocean engineering the program at URI and I was immediately like, immediately pretty uh, um, dead set on doing ocean engineering but yeah. I had no idea about ROVs and stuff until I came out here a couple years ago and um, was convinced that was what I wanted to do after coming out here. And when you came out, and you came out as an intern that first I time, did. yeah? Yes, did I you did. have experience with ROVs like at I, all before you I came? I had taken the, uh, our, our um, program, had a couple of classes in ocean robotics and mm -hmm. ROVs, and very introductory. Um, and so I had, I had figured out at that point what they were, and, that's, and then I ended up applying to the internship. Uh, but I really had no experience whatsoever in ROVs or robotics. Nice. I appreciate you sharing that. And yeah, we've talked before about, and on this watch specifically, just how um, valuable these internships are. And if we've got young people that are watching that are interested in learning more and coming aboard and having one of these experiences, definitely apply. Even if you're sitting here and you're like, I don't know if that's right for me. I don't know if I'm going to be selected. Just apply anyways, and you never know. And those Thank applications should open up in a couple months. Yeah. I think it's supposed to be October, isn't it? Like next, like soon. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Can we zoom in on these little yellow spots, please? I've been noticing quite a few of them. I got, haven't got quite a good look at them. Wondering if they're coral bases or if there's something else. I cannot identify coral bases, but I can identify something else. I keep getting these weird perches where it feels like we're teeter tottering. All right, go for zoom. Go on in. That's not true. Yeah, it's just that sponge. I'm pretty sure. All of these rocks just have really small botryoidals, so grape-like. That's what you're looking at right now. That's full cool zoom. And I've noticed that the flows, it almost looks like there was a low bait that was just covered by a sheet flow. Because I'm not I'm seeing out. any of the indentations, but I am seeing like the, the bulge, like the bulge. Yeah. Thank you. You got it. But it could just be also just a low bait flow, like in that space between being a low bait flow and being a sheet flow. So a high bait flow instead yeah. of a low bait flow is higher velocity. Yeah. But then I'm, I can't, I think these rocks are attached to it. Attached to the flow. I think that this is low bait still not pillow because yeah. it looks attached to me especially this larger stuff up here yeah tito would you be able to share a little bit with us about your path and how you ended up here Oh, sure. Uh, well, I got the travel bug quite early. My uh, parents were quite older and used to send me to Norway to spend my summers when I was a teenager. And, uh, and after hearing all the stories, my father was a sailor. He used to tell me stories about Singapore and Shanghai and all that. I decided I was going to work on the oceans and travel the world. And at 17, dropped out of high school, joined the Navy. Uh, did three years there and, and saw some really interesting places got out of the Navy and was fortunate enough to uh, apply down at Woods Hole Oceanographic and my first cruise was the Titanic Discovery where I saw the first kind of the origins of the, the tools that were used to do these things. And this was before ROVs pretty much. They were just starting to be developed. Actually the first ROV we developed at Woods Hole was Jason Jr. and that was uh, went down onto the Titanic with the Alvin submarine and was flown off of the porch of Alvin into the um, into the Titanic and it was that uh, original footage of the grand ballroom and the big staircase mm -hmm. and all that. But 
In many ways, I remember being so impressed by those people running around in their blue jumpsuits with the uh, DSL logo on the back and thinking, I want to do that someday. <laughs> and spent 15 years as Marine crew, and there was an opportunity came up in uh, 2000. And once again, I ended up in the Black Sea uh, looking for shipwrecks with Dr. Ballard. And, uh, there was some openings back in the deep submergence lab, so I took one as soon as I could, and here I am. I love that. Ta-da. Ta Such an awesome story. <laughs> it's funny um, that Jason Jr. was built before Jason because similarly little Herc was built before Herc. It's like Bob knows that he has to build the Junior before he can build the big one. That's funny. That is. And I was lucky enough, I one of the first pilots of Little Herc back in the day. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, on that 2000 leg, yeah. Because yep. they, yeah, Hercules, I think, was built for the 2003 mission when they oh. did the first excavation of that wreck. Um, so, yeah, they, uh, Little, yeah, I little, little Herc Ballard would have been first. Yeah, I want to gotten some money from uh, National Geographic, and Jim Newman said, oh, for that, for what you could rent a vehicle, I could build one. Ah. Uh, so I there remember you go. the story. And, that's, and little so, Herc that was sounds born. about right. Yeah. I know uh, several pilots who Little Herc was the first ROV they flew, and then they moved on to a much larger ROV, and they they really think that flying Little Herc was great training because you have, you know, more limited controls, and it's so snappy. Well, what was so cool about it, too, was Argus, and it's uh, pan and tilt, and 1,200-watt uh, HMI yeah. lights would just light up the whole bottom. Yeah. And you could see what you were, you could fly yeah. them side by side. And, yeah. Can we get a peek to the left just to see the strike of this? I think we're hitting a wall again. Thank you. That's good. Oh, by the way, if you guys see a avocado-shaped object, a purple color, kind of rolling around like a um, tumbleweed, tumbleweed, we have to collect that. You have to. What would it be? Did you lose something over the side? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we saw it earlier in the dive. Um, it is a completely unknown animal that Chris Kelly really said it was. Wow. He said that there's only been a handful seen. Is this a sea, uh, an acorn worm? This is a cucumber. Oh. The what we're looking for is a bright purple. No, no, I'm just asking what this is. Oh yeah, it's a cucumber. Oh. Cucumber. I really am shocked to see a cucumber on such a little like bit yeah. of sediment. Yeah. Sediment. Yeah. yeah. I saw a few earlier, too, where there was just, like, no sediment at Maybe all. Maybe they can process the stuff that's on the rocks, you know, pull it off of there. Mm -hmm. Although I haven't seen, like, trails or anything. Well, it also could have gotten blown over here or something. There was, like, two right by each other. It was crazy. They're fighting for the little sediment there was. Yeah. Territorial sea cucumbers. So in regards to that, Sebastian, um, if it's the only one we see, isn't the permit required that we see at least 10 of them? Um, in some case, in most cases, yes, but the permit has an exception for exceptionally novel organisms. This organism would be exceptional in the fact that it's a completely unidentifiable animal. In which case, we shouldn't take it if it's something that's never been seen? Um, if it's the only one, would that be proper to take that? Well, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the only one. Didn't you say they saw one earlier? Yeah, we did see one earlier. Oh, okay. Um, but if it's an exceptional case, it's one of those situations that if it's completely under the science, it will absolutely, no matter what, forward science and our understanding of life on our planet. Okay, I just want to make sure that we're following our permit yes. um, requirements and criteria. 
There's a um, summary of the permit considerations on the dive plan, page 5, and uh, it says only one specimen can be collected per morphotype if an abundance assessment cannot be ascertained. Does that fall into... Yeah, it would fall under that. ...that we were talking about? A broken stalk. What does morphotype mean in this context? It means a um, morphology that is completely unique to anything we've seen prior and known to be in this area and to be just known in general. What's a synonym for morphology? Or a definition of morphology? Yeah, Chris Kelly is very familiar with the um, collections in the permit running um, the Hawaii Undersea Research Laboratory and he was one who was requesting that we immediately collect it if we ever see it again. Could be a major discovery, it sounds like. Yes. The uh, Undersea Research Laboratory sounds so much more sophisticated than HURLS. HURLS. The abbreviation Earl. for Hawaii Undersea Research Lab. Same entity, much more sophisticated. Way yeah, Earl it. sounds like you're seasick. Yeah. Can you, uh, can you give me a DVL reset, Derek? Yep. Right. Love these things. This looks like layers of lava flows. Probably layers oh, really? of lobate flows. And it's so weird that they all stop at the same area forming this wall. Well, it could be from faulting, especially if it's a cal if we're on a caldera, uh, there right. could have been extreme faulting during the collapse that formed the caldera. I gotta find some uh, stills for you of the collapse zone at Axial Seamount. That was a lava pool that then drained, and then the top of it collapsed in, leaving the pillars. That sounds so cool. Yeah, looks like a I would love to see that Roman temple or something. It's very cool. And on a large scale, like Herc, could go down inside that. And, uh, That's insane. Still, yeah, Where was this? Uh, Axial Seamount's about 400 kilometers off of uh, the west coast of North America. It's at the spreading zone of the Plate of Juan de Fuca and the Pacific Plate. Okay. So if you look on Google Earth at the west coast and the uh, Pacific Ocean, we know that's a gross uh, estimate pitch. of what's on the bottom, but you'll see a line that runs from Vancouver Island to the south by southwest and then makes a 90 degree turn towards uh, the continent and that's the boundary of the Plate of Juan de Fuca and it's on the uh, that part of the boundary and on the other side of the plate there's a subduction zone wait so repeat where off the coast of what city so uh, like Florence Oregon Newport Oregon okay um, Astoria. Astoria, yeah. About 200 miles off the coast. And you're talking about Axial? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, we've been doing studies there for years and years with a volcanologist named Bill Chadwick. And yep. he actually predicts the eruptions with some accuracy. Like due to really the good accuracy. A, a crazy accuracy, but what? it's all about uh, looking at the inflation with uh, the ROV Jason with a pressure recorder on it. And we'll go yep. put the pressure recorder down on different benchmarks that he's had in place for years and years. It measures the inflation and uh, predicts and it's when the, it'll erupt. It's the rate of inflation that ch that he's also looking at, not just how much has come up, but how quickly. Uh, and is Chadwick with PML? He is retired and uh, uh, doing it as a sideline. It's Scott Nooner from UNC, I believe, uh, uh, is kind of headlining it these days, but Bill's still doing the math. So it's called Astoria? Yeah, it's uh, where the Columbia River uh, comes in between Washington and Oregon. 
Not Astoria is the last town there. Yeah, it's the very peak it's out a, there. It's a very interesting town. I so went there once a long time ago. Did you go to the Goonies house? I did. I did. Really? Yeah. I went there. That's, that's awesome. I used to race some sailboats there. Uh, man, you get wind there. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> we had us. It's a small race right in the river. Uh, Columbia is huge, so it doesn't feel like a river. It's not far from there that the Coast Guard trains the crews of their rescue vessels that are built to roll over. They completely submerge and roll and right themselves. Yeah. And the crew members are all strapped in. Those are so. amazing. I had a buddy, a buddy of mine is a air, uh, helicopter pilot, and he was he had the job for a number of years to helicopter out the pilots that would um, pilot ships across the Columbia River bar when it was too rough to send a boat out to deliver the pilots. They would helicopter them in and drop them on deck. That seems to have become a more regular thing, the helicopter thing. Yeah, we've the last time I was out there, they really? were doing that almost exclusively. Okay. And it was just crazy to watch a guy jump out of a helicopter <laughs> with a cable. Yeah. Say, hey, how you doing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. San Francisco, we've taken on pilot by a helicopter before, too. Sounds like a hunt for Red October. Yeah, without cutting it and dropping well, the person yeah. into the I sea. Ideally not. Yeah, he did that for a while, my friends, and then he, I was like, what are you doing now? He's like, oh, I'm uh, flying those helicopters that fight fires. <laughs> I was like, man, you're an adrenaline junkie. Yeah, that sounds exciting. Jeez. Also terrifying. Hot. So, Hannah, if you actually search for axial seamount in Google Earth, Google Maps. Okay, it, I'm doing it right now. Yeah, it actually pops up, but... Uh, you need to turn on the terrain layer, I think it is. Is it terrain that shows the... I think she has it on, because she was finding, yeah. we were finding seamounts earlier, and then Randy yelled at us. <laughs> He's like, we have so many mapping systems on board, you have to use Google Earth. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, it's the one that we have right here, so... <laughs> yeah. Tool that you it's have. Fine. Oh, wow, okay, okay. He didn't yell at us, he just laughed at us. Yeah. It's kind of... It's not really seat mounting. I was about to at say, it, it looks destroyed. <laughs> it, uh, it rises like 2,000 meters. Yeah, so. it's, a, it's actually a pretty decently sized one. That's crazy. Yeah, Could be that that's, that it's point isn't exactly there. I know, I, it can't be. Yeah. There's no it way. Could be like that. Yeah, this makes more sense than... They'd I mean, I see a, a possible... It might Great. just be like close. Is that a. Can I uh, take a look? Met Metallos, the metal. Yeah, Metallogorgia. That one. I got the first part right. The gorgeous metal. Can you zoom in? What? Uh, I've worked oh. on the axle seamount before, so I know what I'm looking for. <laughs> um, let's see. I that is the caldera. This? This round piece right it's here. It's about two this? kilometers. Yeah. One and oh, okay. Two kilometers that makes across. more sense. Yeah, Google Earth has the position slightly yeah, off. Yeah, it's slightly off. It was definitely at a weird place that I was like, what? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I oh. see. Can we zoom in on this sponge, please? Sure. Over zoom. Hate how Go in. Doing this on the fly. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. You got it. We're on our way. All right. Can I the seamount that you chose for your research, was it hard for you to decide which ones you were interested in um, studying? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of, so originally, actually, I was gonna do the Voyager seamounts along with the Mid-Pacific Mountains and the Hess Rise. That was my original project, but our ship kind of fell through <laughs> in February. So then I had to pivot and now I'm just doing the Voyager Seamounts, but I still plan to be on that cruise that goes to the Mid-Pacific Mountains. Not sure what's gonna be my <laughs> next step for <laughs> PhD, but... Look, uh, uh, my <laughs> dissertation ended up being not a single thing that I didn't originally planned, so... <laughs> yep, I, exactly, so that's one of the things in grad school that you learn is just like, 
pivot. To pivot, constantly. yeah. Constantly. <laughs> constantly adapt to changes that happen because research is always going to have problems or Especially if, actually my best advice for people in grad school is as, as amazing and cool as a project sounds, do a desktop-based, <laughs> library-based dissertation. <laughs> do not count on field work. I, I'm, I'm totally mean I it. know, I know you mean get it. The, get, the, get the certificate, get your diploma and your PhD do it using library resources. Do some subject like that that may sound boring and you can do all the field work you want after. Relying on field data for your dissertation is just going to make it take forever. It's Every just, time. It's that a happened lot. to me. I did. I took eight years to do Three it. Three field schools <laughs> fell through. Yeah. And I was yeah. just like, one was in the Marquesas. There were two in Hawaii. <gasps> Marquesas? Yeah. It was awful. I had just so planned to be there. And then they fall in and you just have no field work experience. Yeah. <laughs> so I ended mm -hmm. up doing like a kind of crappy one. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it wasn't archaeology. It was historic oh, wow. preservation more architecture, so it didn't really fill my bucket for field school. What kind of data were you trying to collect before or that you were looking for with those original? So I basically was, my intent was to go down, my advisor was Barry Roulette, and he was studying um, fish, fishing, fish hooks, um, and looking at the um, typology based on like throughout Polynesia. Mm -hmm. So the Marquesans, um, Hawaii, because we do have some cultural connections. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that was really interesting. And we were going to be living with Marquesan families. So there was a cultural components to it. Right. Um, you know, they speak uh, Marquesan language, um, French as well. So it was going to be a brand new experience. And then also the ethnography part I was really interested in and um, kind of assessing like their connections to fishing and and the stories of fishing and so it was it was perfect and then it just all fell through <laughs> so bummed <laughs> but kind of like a compar comparative analysis mm -hmm. between two polynesian um, cultures mm. that, that it sounds like it would have been cool yeah it sounds very cool <laughs> i oh. would have been bummed I'll bet you that um, the majority of us in here have had expeditions booked and then canceled for one reason or another. Yeah, it's yeah. part of life. You just got to adapt. My master's work was delayed about eight months because I couldn't get a hydrophone that I needed for field work because it was held up and um, the shipping, all the shipping was held up. and. Uh, it was getting delivered from New Zealand of all places, wow. and it, it was stuck in, it got lost in uh, customs, it was held up in, on a ship that couldn't get, because all those ships were stuck in port, uh, yep. or like off the coast. Wow, was, we, we left, uh, actually did we go out? I think it was 2020, the port of Los Angeles, it was seemed like every container ship in the world was anchored yeah. offshore. You don't, real, you don't realize those problems exist sometimes. Supply chain. All these rocks look so beautiful. They're all so angular. It's like oh it's gosh. like there's not any cr a manganese crust on them, it's or not much. Beautiful. Something right <laughs> under the laser. I don't know what that was. Hmm? A little white dot down there. <laughs> Like really, we oh. I mean, these all look loose. Like we've seen a lot yeah. of stuff that's like all encrusted, but this, this seems like it was broken yesterday. Mm -hmm. We're getting close. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday being like 10 million years mm -hmm. or something. Let's hope uh, 80 to 100 million years okay, ago. Okay, okay, Geolo <laughs> geologically yesterday. <laughs> Are we thinking about a sample sometimes soon? Or? I, I'm gonna wait a little bit. I know literally they just got one right before yeah. we got on. Oh, okay. So I'm hoping like right after wave point nine on the way to wave point nine point five in between there. Yeah, I think I think towards the, the lip of the caldera makes more sense. Yes. Right where Derek has the cursor? Yes, probably yeah. just a probably a little bit higher. He always has yeah, right, right there. Yeah. Here. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Derek always has his his cursor in the right place. That's fine. I wasn't really even does. looking at the map or his screen. <laughs> yeah. I just knew he had the cursor <laughs> right where he wanted to go. That's I had to move it that time. Uh, <laughs> just a yeah, little bit. Yeah, but just a little bit. <laughs> now that's weird. It was and then close enough. Is that a sea star or a brittle? 
There's got to be a C star. Which one? Uh, Which one? Right edge Here? of frame. Oh, this one. Oh, uh, the white. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the white. That's a C star. Wow. I'm not sure we've seen these that are all before. crinoids on here. Yeah, these are all crinoids the, and some brittle ones. stars. And some, yeah, okay. Is that mushroom, mushroom in the coral. background? Yeah, mushroom yeah. coral. Anemone in the bottom. Mushroom coral. Oops, mushroom coral. Anemone, brittle stars, crinoids. I'm just using the Telestrator for our fans. You could Sponge, do that. Sponge, <laughs> crinoid. Not a big fan of the arrow, huh? The blue arrow. Uh, I just don't like to change it from draw because then it doesn't. It, then I forget I changed it and it doesn't do stuff. Uh. <laughs> Okay, Sebastian told me while we weren't on watch that no, I don't brittle like that. stars aren't star sea stars. And I couldn't believe that. Because why, why are they named that if they're not? <laughs> because <laughs> sea stars belong to the class Astroidea and brittle stars belong to the class Ophiroida. So it's just... So... Okay, it's just really interesting that they're still called, they have the name star in it. They're still shaped like a star, it's just yeah. the traditional sea not. star is Asteroidia. That's so crazy to me. It's so crazy. What about basket stars? Trying to get back out in front. Um, basket really stars are, are I believe they are also Asteroidia. Okay, so they are sea stars. Yes. Wow. They're closer to Brazingids. And Brazingas are also um, sea stars. What? But crinoids are not. No. Crinoids belong to the class Crinoidia. That makes sense. We're doing meal, quick meal change of video. We've got a few folks changing in and out for our dinner break for the four to eight watch. So you're gonna maybe hear some new voices jumping in and out. Well, the, cur the, <laughs> the current's definitely coming from the right because that's where everything's facing. You're yeah. flying there. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it just must be, it must just be fluctuating with the conditions, I guess. Okay, we'll just hold with that then. Thank you. So Hannah, we had a viewer asking a while back about columnar jointed rocks, and if we come across them, would we be able to collect them, and would we want to? Or are those usually fragmented or broken apart? So I actually talked to Val about the columnar jointing, and we haven't seen any of it yet, but we have seen like just normal jointing. So we did actually collect a sample with jointing, and it had great minerals in it that we're going to use for age determinations to find out how old it is in comparison to the other rocks that were found there. Because usually if you have, well, the way that we see the jointing is through a dike. And actually I've seen a few dikes, but I've kind of not really said anything because a lot of people have been sharing really important information. So I'm sure we'll come across another one soon. And... So, where was I going with this? Okay, yeah, <laughs> I remember, I remember. So, usually with dikes, it's young, it's younger than the rock that it intrudes upon, intrudes upon, so you're expecting it to be younger than the surrounding flow. Mm -hmm. But when I was talking to Dr. Val, she was saying that might not always be the case for these seamounts. So, I would be, I'm really curious to see what that jointing dike will, it in comparison to just one of the normal mm -hmm. rocks that we take from a different flow of that same seamount. So I'm really happy, even though it was a massive rock, it was massive. <laughs> I think it was almost a, like over 40 pounds. <laughs> and, um, but we were able to cut a slice off of it because of the jointing, because 
a sliver of it was sticking out further than the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So we were able to cut that slab off and thank goodness because we saw a fantastic rock sample in there with amphiboles and I think clinopyroxenes, which are perfect for age determinations because they contain potassium. <laughs> yeah, potassium 39, potassium 40. Nice, thank you for that. No problem. Thanks for asking. Because I also had the same exact question. <laughs> also really funny, my, when we were talking about pivoting, my mom was like, you need to pivot back home. <laughs> she said that in there, too. Oh, she did? Yeah. She texted me that. I was like, sorry, Mom. <laughs> I don't know if I can. <laughs> <laughs> it's just geology in Louisiana is more centered upon, like, sedimentology yeah. and like Mississippi Gulf River, Mexico. conservation of the wetlands. And I'm more interested in these hard rock seamounts. I love them. And <laughs> being able to do this in person, I was like, it really makes, makes me feel even more confident in my decision to come out here instead of staying in Louisiana. Mm. I feel like I was meant to be here. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like we've come to a little bit of a downslope. Um, but it should start coming up again. Looks like there's a little bit of a rise here. And waypoint nine might be at this, like a small dip, dip in topography, and then we'll be heading back up again. Oh, there's a cucumber taking off right there. Oh, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen one, like, move like that yet. It's launching. Yeah. Cucumber going for launch. <laughs> That's so cute. Yeah, I've never seen that. I haven't seen that either. Moving pretty fast. Actually, faster than I thought. Oh, this is a, also a headless chicken monster variation oh, yeah. on it. Cause it has like those suction cup looking uh, head. Yep. <laughs> Look at it in this little camera. Yeah. Mike, I feel like you're a photographer now. Like you can yeah, have but I have, a, I have a smudge on my lens. I know. But I just love that camera. Yeah, me too. So Asako was telling us a little bit about, um, apparently um, Mike was talking about seeing a cucumber on a rock earlier. And uh, she was talking, about, and, you, and I believe you said that you're not used to seeing cucumbers on rocks along those lines. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, it wasn't Mike, it was you, okay. Um, so actually cucumbers can be common on rocks. Okay. Especially in more shallow environments. Um, they can, here's a picture actually right here. They can kind of look, embed themselves a little bit into the rock and kind of like stay there. Suction onto it or something? Um, some of them suction, I think, but I think, that, or use glues, but there are some that actually burrow their way into the rock and stay there. That's crazy. Yeah, they look too delicate to, like, <laughs> yeah, to burrow. Mm -hmm. That's. How do they do that? They usually just find cracks in the wall and sensitivities in the wall, and they kind of just work from there, I think. What? I think they're less common in the deep sea, but they still do occur. Apparently, they, um, Chris and Asako have been sent them in the past, thinking that 
researching that there were types of anemones when there were actually cucumbers. Mm. Yeah, I've been surprised. I mean, I didn't really know anything about sea cucumbers before coming out here, and I've been surprised at the diversity and like shape and color. Oh, they can be incredibly diverse. Yeah. There is a um, doctoral student in my lab who's actually dedicated her entire research to studying um, sea cucumbers, particularly their gut microbiomes. Yeah. Mm. They've grown on me. I think they're cute now. Let's try uh, 20 East. Uh, yeah, so should we move along? Yeah. Um, we're going to do 20 easterly, if that's okay. We're gonna do what? 20 meters easterly. Okay, um, yeah. What I would love to see is the uh, Bissell Plain sea pigs. Have you guys seen those? No, but I'll look that up. Say the name again. Sea pigs. Sea pigs. They're a type of deep sea sea cucumbers. Oh. Okay. Sorry. No, I, think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. Well, there's I some species cool. that can look like very like cute. I feel and plump. like this would be in like Men in Black or something. Yeah. Like this little creature. Oh. <laughs> They're kind of cute. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think I like the headless chicken monster better. Me but. too. We all have our tastes. And there's another fallen stock. Someone asked a little bit ago about Dumbo octopus sightings, and I don't think I've heard that we've seen one. Not this we, dive. We Not actually this have. This on dive? This dive, apparently oh. the last ship saw a group of oh. We saw one on our, our watch. What? Yeah. What, was it a white one? Um, it was one that we saw in the last couple times. Yeah, it looks similar to the ones we've seen. It was a surprise. It came out of nowhere. And it also had like a Oh, what was that? It seemed to be rare. Something with a red dragon in it. A red dragon? Tinafore. Tinafore? Oh, a red dragon tinafore. Huh. In it? In it? Oh, sorry, no, floating next to it. Oh. But I was saying the red thing was in whatever that floaty thing was. Yeah, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> it was a red tinafore. Red tinafore. Dan, Dan called it out. Nice. Thanks, Dan. You said red dragon or just red tinafore? Red tinafore. I don't know where dragon came from. <laughs> I looked it up and I was like, oh, they're what? I think, someone, I think someone else had shouted that out as something they were thinking of and it just stuck in my head. Yeah, yeah. even Google's confused. Google was, yeah. Because we saw a red tinafore on one of our previous watches as well. It was Aww. very cool to look at. I look it up and the first thing is a Nautilus YouTube video about nice. it. Nice. How cute. From Perfect. 2022. That is pretty crazy to wrap your head around that a lot of the Nautilus cruises supply like the first sightings of these yeah, creatures. Yeah, no, it's amazing. That's I mean, and, and just having an RV down here you know, you're going to see so much new stuff okay. because That's this been stuff has completely never uh, never been uh, dived before, these seamounts. I love science. <laughs> <laughs> I love Bright yellow ball so mid. I'm 
maybe we'll see a octopus as we get closer to the caldera. Who knows? Yeah, could be. Maybe it's their secret breeding ground. No longer a secret. There's one of those pink, I think it's one of those pink blind lobster things. Oh, oh one of the yeah. aspers, I think they're called. At Easterly. Roger. Oh, what was our like, debate yesterday? Was that? What debate? The debate about Sebastian. The oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, we, this might be a good um, medium to get a poll. Um, you guys know Sebastian from The Little Mermaid, yes? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. um, is Sebastian a crab or a lobster? Uh, well, isn't, isn't it a spe specified in the live action one? Don't they make him one or the other? I haven't We're seen We're going it, based on We're the original. We're going cartoon. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. I think a crab. Okay. Just pick one. Crab. Yep. Okay. Okay. Lobster. <laughs> Front row? I don't know. I'm thinking about it. I'm leaning towards lobster. Okay. Is there a, a actual answer that we're yes. going to learn? Okay. Like lobster, like crayfish. Maybe it's a crawfish. Yeah, like crayfish type. Oh. Crayfish? Maybe Crawfish. it's a king crab. <laughs> I say crab. I say crab as well. Okay, look, uh, look to the west for me. So the answer, I end up looking up later, but uh, apparently, like, it's a mistake. Or not. Um. <laughs> because Disney says somewhere officially in some super old booklet that he's a lobster. East. But then, like, I think they got yeah, it wrong like and they tried to okay. retract it. Sorry. You heard good. Sorry, one second. Um, but it's like very disputed now because of it. Ah, uh, so there's not really an answer. Well, I think the intention was it to him to be a crab. Ah. Uh. He's definitely a crab. Just with a very anthropomorphized face that gives him a more elongated look than he actually yeah. is. What was he depicted as in the live action? A crab. crab. Okay. Ironically, a land crab. So yeah. theoretically, you shouldn't be able to breathe you underwater. Go back to whatever line they were tracking. I would rather just do moves, so though. Or whatever. Um, we're going to go back to tracking that line you guys were tracking before we sat down. Sounds right. good. Oh, wow. Several large sponges. All of these big sponges have tons of crinoids on them. Mm -hmm. I feel like, since it's, I don't know, I feel like I haven't seen a lot of sponges, so when they see one, they're just yeah, like Yeah, they just glom, on, glom onto it. And sponges, these, all these bigger sponges typically have found a really good spot of current, so of course other animals want to hop on and take advantage of that too. I mean, that would have been a great still, shot, still camera shot if it were for that smudge. I'm going to take it anyway. <laughs> Well, I'm yeah. getting some good shots right here, though. Sorry, that's our bad. What, I think we got happened? the sponge. I don't know. It just appeared. Yeah, it's weird. Flame Hans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Don't don't flame Hans. Yeah, every time you let him drive the ROV, he smacks into stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good shot. To wait for the boat. Oh, dump, dump. Close. Oh, you're going for a little bit of a ride. Come down. Ah, you're pulling me. Pulling me, pulling me.
Okay, you cut the spin around there. We're trying to get Atalanta out into uh, deeper water there so we can come down the hill. The problem with tracking a line is you can't follow the local bathymetry. So you wind up, you know. What's that? Uh, yeah, sure. I wasn't talking to the back, I was talking to you. You're the navigator. Yeah, so when you're tracking a line, the local, you know, you're not chasing the local bathymetry, then you wind up. I can hear you. Right. Typically track a line when it's flat, but, you know, track a line yeah. on a sea mount is... No, I agree. I mean, it typically not. Bathy lines cool. aren't, like, straight or perfect. You can, you can, but you got to stay high and move, you know, and... Uh, you get that big layback and get up against, uh, wind up against, uh, you know, one of those 100 meter cliffs like we saw the other night that's not on the bathymetry, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Can you get around there? Yeah, you're going to have to look backwards. We got.
I don't know. Where are we? No. Are we we're not in the, we're anywhere not, near the caldera, we're not are we? Near it yeah. all, no. It's at the end, right? Yeah. I think we just came off a ridge and trying to get to another. It's kind of like a s steps. You get up and then a little flatter and then back up. <laughs> not a fan of this whole backing up thing, but uh, figure it out. What's the, uh, why are you doing that? Uh, Dan wanted to do it. Because... Backing up. Just allows you to look at the slope while you're moving off, like, down slope. Instead of looking out at the blue water. <coughs> Yeah, we're going downhill. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's why I'm not a fan of it, but... <clears throat> I like to, to lateral down slope. Uh, Seems like we're already down though, so. You can bring your heading to the east. Yeah, you can bring your heading to the east. Adelanto's heading? Yep. Jake, when you say heading, do you mean the direction that Atalanta is facing? Yes. Which helps pull Hercules where you want Hercules to be? It, uh, it's, it gives us like an eye, our eyes in the sky. So mm -hmm. the way Atalanta is facing is the way its camera is facing. So it, we want it to kind of be looking in the direction of travel or mm -hmm. at, at Hercules, give us some spatial awareness and uh, some good good shots of what's going on around Hercules that we can't see from the main cameras. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, thank you. Nap. Can we slow down a little bit to 0 0.2? Same bearing, thank you. Cliff looks pretty steep. Mm -hmm. oh. Looks cool in the sonar. It does. The lines that we're seeing in the sediment, does that indicate current? Because they don't look like... The ripples? I guess, yeah. Yeah. They often form perpendicular to the flow. So 
sonar image looks like a dragon. Yeah, let's put that out on the set for just a moment. Oh, that's not good. Which one's uh, sonar? Oh, here it is. T-Rex. Would you say it looked like Derek? I thought it looked like a dragon. Now I'm thinking more like a T-Rex, maybe. <laughs> I think we just passed a uh, life and human enemy. And we have some nice whips, probably a bamboo coral whip. That's kind of a strange looking rock formation. Mm -hmm. With the overhang? No, it's just, it looked white or grayish on uh, the one side. I'll stop. There you go. I just want to approach this a little bit cautiously. All right. Um, I'm fine with that. I want to see how much sway is left in there. Holothurian. You're moving pretty fast there. When, uh, when those holothurians don't have any sediment in them, they're holothurians. They are holothurians. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great dad joke. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> So guys, I know we're approaching where the look for rock target is, but we'll, Hannah should be back up in a bit. We'll, um, it doesn't need to be exactly there. We, we can stand by until she uh, makes it up here. I don't, want, I don't want to pick the wrong rock. We're going to be in trouble too, because so. it's Jake's birthday. So Hannah's going to gorge on high sugar cake and come up here all amped up. Cake. That's true. She's going to be on a sugar high, yeah. yeah. Cake down there. Yeah, yeah, they just brought it out. They do it when the per birthday person birthday shows up. Out, yeah. No one's cut into it yet, so we're not missing anything yet. So it looks Might like it's also absolutely massive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we've got this cliff in front of us, and then I think after that was where she was looking for a rock. Yeah, I think so. so we could we could go up there kind of slowly. Oh yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no rush, no, no reason to just sit here. I just was saying trips. I'm not. I'm not going to take her fun away from her and <laughs> pick it for her. Sounds good. Oh, sorry, Hannah. No more rock sampling. All done. The sugar high would turn into sugar anger real quick. That's a unique sponge. Have That's we seen one like that before? Is you black Have we seen those before? Yeah. Oh, okay. It would be cool to have a T4 with the uh, camera in the wrist, take a peek in there. Bridge, nav. Please do a ship move to zero meters at zero eight zero. Thank you. Are you able to take a question right now, Pashna? Um, there's a question about what was the most interesting sample you've collected so far from this expedition? Do you have anything to share? Oh, collected so far, okay. Um, I think that was a small synaphobranchid eel that we passed. Um, what have we collected? I think, uh, obviously, in term, with respect to my work, the sea pens that we have collected are definitely very important and useful. Uh, I know some of the bamboo corals that have been collected are going to be very crucial for some of the ongoing projects. Uh, the sea star was interesting. Um, yeah, in terms of biology, 
I would say what from what has been collected. Cool. Awesome. And we can check in with Hannah too when she gets back, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> She'll have something to share about her rock samples. And thank you to our viewers for the birthday shout out to um, our ROV intern, Jake. He's having dinner right now. Um, and we just had a cake and a little celebration downstairs in the mess. So um, really proud of Jake. And we just posted a Instagram post about him. So feel free to um, read more about his learning journey on our Instagram. I'm seeing on the map it says look for rock. Are we um, yeah, getting we have a, a rock sample soon? Yeah, once Hannah comes back, we're going to like just get a rock sample. Okay, cool. But like uh, at a start of our watch, she was just saying like approximately where uh, she wanted to look for one. Gotcha. What's your altimeter saying? Like eight or nine now? Altimeter? Eleven. Yeah, Eleven. Eleven? Yeah. There are a few uh, antimasters on the rock and one beautiful Iridogorgia and I still checking for the sponge. I don't think it was a black teller. It's something else. I know what it is, but can't remember the name. Yikes. That's cool. In one of my... Or you black... Yes. You black tell it, but not you black tell Yeah, Derek, you weren't kidding about a wall. Yeah, it's a good one. one. I think it was. Because you said that, and I was like, I don't see anything coming up, but then there it is. Oh, yeah, it's very steep. No. Yeah, it's called the lipped ones. There's a. That's what they're called. Will come back to me. It's in one of my notebooks. It actually looks like, almost like a reverse incline here. It's protruding out as we go up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of does. It's a good shot of uh -huh. Hurricane or in Atlanta. I'm starting to see a shadow on top of Hercules yeah. from the Atalanta lights. Yeah. <laughs> nice shot. Yeah, it's a pretty... It's a big rock right there. Pretty view. That's really strange. Yeah, this is suddenly a very smooth jutting out surface. Oh, and our advertisement. That's <laughs> odd. It's like the lava flow went around it. Bridge now. Please do 25 meters at bearing 095. Yes. Thank you. Yes, that was a rose I led. Patty Doris. Another one of those small paragorgias. One mushroom coral. Some dead sponges coming up on Chrysogorgia. That's cool. Is that the Chrysogorgia? Yeah, Chrysogorgia. A 
another Antomastus. <laughs> yeah. We have Iridogorgias, Small Paragorgias, Chrysogorgia, Ophirate Sponge, Antomastus. What is that? Is that a Brisinger? That would be the first. This? Yeah. I'm not sure what that is. Oh no, it's some kind of a coral. It's just the wrong angle that I'm looking at. <coughs> sea star metallogorgia. That's a big fan that we're coming up on. Yeah, <coughs> back here. Mm -hmm. If we can get a quick zoom on that, that would be great. Yeah, can we get a zoom on this yellow coral, please? It's interesting how it has spread its branches. Yeah, it's unusual. It has got lots of uh, chirostylid uh, squat lobsters on it. Yeah. And I see two anthomasters on the right and a couple of fairy Over sponges in the background. I can do a fold back here. Yep, this is what I was afraid of. So this was a dead uh, coral skeleton which has been completely overgrown by hydroids. Oh, wow. Yep. And yeah, that's a nice zoom on a on the squat lobster though. Thank you so much. Of course. Yeah, thanks, so Eddie. Move push. on. Tiny push. That's an interesting yeah, view of the ledge. Yeah. It's really huge. It's a good moving place. And for our viewers just tuning in from the US, Canada, Australia, Uruguay, Japan, and China, thank you so much for joining us and exploring the deep sea. We're currently in Papa Hanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, and we're exploring an unnamed seamount which is located roughly 45 nautical miles southeast of Pearl and Hermes Atoll. Uh, this seamount was mapped previously for the first time in 2014 by RV Falcor, um, and now we're getting some of the first uh, imagery as well as some physical samples of rocks and um, 
uh, biological samples uh, as we explore this area. So feel free to let us know if you have any questions in the chat box on our page and we'll get to them when we can. Thank you. Did you say we had viewers in Uruguay? Yeah. Two of our crew are from Uruguay. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, our uh, ship's officer, mate up on the bridge, and Diego, our ship's electrician. Wow. Are both Uruguayan. We'll have to let them know. Oh, you're missing a... Yeah, so yeah. missing a it's fin? Missing a fin. Yeah. It's missing a Could fin. Only turn to the right. Ooh. Yeah, it looks like it's scarred from... Yeah, I'd be scarred. ...predation as well. Attempted predation, I'll say. Wow. I've never seen that before. That's going to leave a mark. Not cool for the fish. Yeah. And we're seeing this botryoidal texture on the rocks again as well. Grape-like. Uh, and we had a question come in from the chat. Uh, maybe Upashana or Sebastian can help answer. Um, Upashana, mm -hmm. <coughs> you mentioned hydroids earlier, overgrowing that coral skeleton. And yep. can you explain a little bit more about what hydroids are? Hydroids are hydrozoans. Uh, so uh, they are a kind of cnidarians. Uh, class, it's a class. Hydrozoa is a class of hydrozoans. Uh, Nidarians, whereas all the octocorals and hexagorals are in the class uh, Anthozoa. So uh, it's within the they, these are all Nidarians, but these belong to a different class of. Uh, when I say class, it means I'm talking about the taxonomic classification uh, level, and uh, these are uh, colonial, but they generally overgrow. We see them overgrowing rocks or overgrowing dead uh, skeletal material or sometimes on sponges as well. Right. And um, cnidarians, um, those are generally a class of creatures that include jellyfish, corals, and enemies, and they're characterized by s having stinging cells. Yep, um, the 90. So hydrozoans, yeah, I guess they're kind of like, they still got that polyp thing going on, like yeah. anemones and corals do. It's just... Um, they're not it's a necessarily. Body farm, yeah. yeah. So hope that clarifies that a little bit. Yeah, I think the fish that we just saw, which uh, wasn't in the greatest of the shape, was probably a cynaphobranchid eel. It's just that I haven't seen them in a while, so it's going to take me a little bit to confirm. But I think it's an cynaphobranchid eel. We did see one of those earlier and died at the very beginning. Yes. Oh, that's good. And Hannah's back. Thanks, Upashna. Thank you. See Thank you, you later, so much. Upashna. Hmm? Is that a C pen or a no, on that's the a, right that's side? A, on the right? Oh this year or maybe just a um, different morphology of a I bamboo coral a, Upash, what do they call that <laughs> right bathy pathy oh it's that's a black a, coral that's the word yeah see you later so we've just arrived at our look for rock area but I'm not sure if any of this stuff is going to be movable New, we could go up another 25 meters. Yeah, let's, yeah. Move that in and then yeah, let's do that. It's been pretty. Um, some of these might move, but we would get a little bit closer to the caldera. How close are. Well, no, I can look. Is it right at waypoint 11? Waypoint 11? No, the caldera is at waypoint 10. The 11's inside it. Uh, and we're at, we're like just a little bit past nine. So we're like uh -huh. here now. So do we want to go like higher, like right here? That's up to you. I mean, we can go, I mean, yeah, anywhere between here and 10 is gonna be outside the caldera. Okay. So, Maybe we push it 
back along these yep. lines, contour lines. Like the base of that rise? Yes. Uber zoom. Coming in. Oh, and holding. Yeah. The base of maneuvers. Yeah. Flares, chaff. We had a question earlier, what is the most interesting sample you've collected from this expedition so far? And uh, Upashana chimed in, but do you want to share also, Hannah, what's the most interesting rock um, you've, you've been able to collect during this expedition? So my favorite rock that I've collected during this ep exposition, expedition, expedition. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's the sugar. <laughs> yeah, I just I just had a slice of birthday cake for Jacob. <laughs> so Told you. The sugar rush is going to be coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, the coolest rock that we've collected to me have been the hyaloclastites because. We're not really sure what we're looking at, and I find that exciting. And since Val doesn't know what it is, then I'm like, wow, wow this is something yeah. special. Even though it's not our target, I don't really care because it's so cool. <laughs> and I, I still, those rocks, I wish I could take them. I wish I could take them home with me <laughs> so badly because I'm like, these are the coolest. They're so, like, some of them are, like, tinted blue, like wow. a light blue. Oh, wow. And it's just, like, it's so beautiful, and she has no idea what it is. And that is so cool, because I was like, Val knows everything. Well, I, she's going to say, obviously, she doesn't know everything. But to me, she knows so much. <laughs> so the fact that she doesn't know, I'm like, ooh. Wow, like, what is it? that's exciting. Val and is exceptionally humble. <laughs> she is. She is. She's amazing. She's on after us. She's on for Caldera time. Ooh, yeah. Caldera, Caldera clock. Oh, yeah, we're the pre-show. Yeah. yeah, we're the pre-show. We're the opening act. Our job <laughs> is to get her up there. Mm -hmm. get but, to the caldera. Um, she said, we can't know for certain that it's a caldera, but based on the map, That's it, true. Is, it seems a possibility. It's caldera-like features. Yes. And um, in case our viewers don't know what that is, can you help explain what a caldera is? So basically the caldera is the collapse of the, usually the summit of the volcano. So this happens because when the volcano erupts, there's a, a magma chamber. And so when it empties out, it collapses and that forms a caldera. Mm, very cool. Oh, I wanna give a quick shout out. My friend Lucy is watching. She is a special education teacher for young young children and I love all the work she does. She has the most amazing stories and she's really one of the best. I just wanted to highlight her as a teacher because she's fantastic and she really cares for her kids and she's also a great friend. So thanks for watching, Lucy. Thanks, Lucy. Oh, Hannah, that's so sweet. And Lucy, thank you for all you do as an educator. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Lucy, you rock. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, she was. She, I told her to join, and then, she, like a few minutes later, she was like, "Where, where did you go?" And I was like, "Oh, dinner." I was like, "Why didn't you tell me you were on?" <laughs> and then she was like, "I liked watching you in secret." I was like, "I was like, okay." <laughs> but yeah, she's one of my bestest friends. From we went to Dominican together that we did the ship to shore with. Oh. So she was. We met at high school. That's so cool. we, we were roommates in college. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, we were roommates, roommates in college, and she would tell me all about teaching, and she was so, she's so dedicated, and she has all these amazing ideas to be interactive with her students. Yeah. And it just shows she has, like, the most, she's the most patient person in the world. I can't, I don't know anybody more patient than her. <laughs> that's fantastic. Teachers really are like the backbone of our society, I believe. I agree. Yeah. I agree. So, Can yeah. we please get a zoom on this? Go for zoom. Yeah, float and zoom. Float and zoom. focus. On here. Holding. 
partial. What are you? I'm leaning black coral, but I'm not seeing the super traditional black coral yeah. polyp structure. So I might have to look this one up. You want some more polyps? Um, yes, please. Go on super zoom for just a moment. Super zoom. This looks like super zoom. The one that was like completely taken over by hydroid. Yeah. It could be a all hydroid actually. Yeah, that right could before make sense. you uh, came back in, Upashana was talking about a coral that was yeah. just overgrown with just hydroids. Like this. Yeah. This color, yeah. All right. So it could be a dead yeah. black coral. Yeah. Um, huh? Sako agrees with us. It, it is a hydrozoa infested coral. Coming out. All right. Nice flying, thanks. Very similar to the other one we saw. Lucy said thank you all for Aww. those nice words y'all said about her. <laughs> thank she you, really Lucy. Is, she really is a fantastic teacher. Do you have like a mentor that has really helped you um, get where you are currently? Yeah, so I guess it really, again, started in high school. And my biology teachers, Miss Giacona, who I actually also talked on the ship to shore. Wow. All of my science teachers that had a really big impact on me in high school actually were all watching. I love that, yeah. It was, I was almost like getting a little emotional because I, yeah. I love them so much because they were all so passionate about what we were learning in class and like you could feel it like in the classroom that they cared about what they were talking about and I really appreciated that and even when I got to college all of the mentors that I worked under and they were all equally as grateful well I'm equally grateful for all of them and they really shaped me into the the geologist that I am today. And also, I and none loved, of them were geologists. <laughs> yeah. Was, no, no, they were. They were. The oh, ones okay. in college were. Oh, geologists. in college. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, and then <laughs> my my advisor. Thought you were still in high school. Dr. Balvis and obviously Dr. Val and Dr. Conrad, who he they've all been on Nautilus expeditions before, oh. and they are the best advisors ever. I love them so much. They feel like I kind of joke around. We or Dr. Balbus kind of jokes around saying Fish. that um, Dr. Balbus is like the mom. Fish. And then, do we want to rock here? Where are we? Oh, are we gonna are we gonna wait for right here? Okay. I just I was seeing that there's some that are uh, loose, but we don't. Yeah, we can wait. Just checking. I don't. I don't know. I was just gonna check along the okay. the like ridge. Okay. We'll wait. Just checking. Okay. Continue. So, what was it? Sorry. Well, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, mentors, advisors. Oh, yes. Uh, so, mom. Dr. Conrad, <laughs> Dr. Conrad, Dr. Balvis, and Dr. Val have really been, oh, yeah. So, Dr. Balvis is like my mom, and then Dr. Conrad is like my dad, <laughs> and then Dr. Val is like my aunt. Wow. That's the way, like, <laughs> we whole just, geology family. I yeah, love it. <laughs> yeah. It's like a geology family. <laughs> But I have, I also have like great grandpas and like grandpas. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is so cute. I love that. Yeah, I love so that. So I love how Dr. Balvis like kind of, she started saying that and I was like, wow, it, this feels more, I guess, intimate and like, it feels like they actually, you know, care That's about cool. me. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Also, another one of my friends is starting to watch. Her name's Ashton and she's a geologist. Oh, that's cool. So she...